I've had a lot of questions about the standalone ECU and how I've done the wiring in my MX-5 swapped MGB over the last couple of weeks. There's so many different varieties of engines, uh, there's plenty of different aftermarket ECUs and you might not even be putting this engine in this vehicle. But in this video I intend to try and cover a lot of the do's and don'ts but also some advice, tips and tricks that might be or might not be engine specific when it comes to wiring up your own standalone ECU. Sounds obvious, but every aftermarket ECU that you buy will come with a set of destructions. Now, generally, these are 200 pages long, and it's a lot of information to crunch, but I cannot stress enough, read that document, go through it, and then try and digest and write down any issues that flag up or that you might not remember specifically. Some ECUs might have certain quirks with them, and it's worth taking note of as many tripping points as possible because it's easier to catch those before you do any wiring rather than trying to strip apart any wiring looms that you might have taped up prior to that. Another point off the back of that is if you can test as many of the different looms before you start wrapping things up in loom tape or uh, securing it into the car, what it does is just confirm that you've got the wiring correct and you're not actually having to undo that later so as much as it might seem like a bit of a pain to do the preliminary work it definitely saves you time in the long run because i'll i'll say it, this is probably the fifth ecu that i've wired up now and i've never got one 100 percent right first time there's always little bits that you think oh i connected that or i missed out a wire in somewhere when it comes to selecting which ecu you're going to use try to select something that's got a bit of aftermarket support if you're new to this game you want to have a look on facebook forums and um, that sort of thing or just amongst uh, your, your friends if somebody's got an ecu that you, that's similar that you can ask questions don't just go with uh, an ecu because other people have used it in that vehicle it doesn't always make sense and lastly what i would say is go with a reputable brand it's all right using a self-built ecu but when it comes to fault diagnostics, if you're having problems getting the engine started and you've actually built that ECU from scratch yourself, if you've bought an ECU, uh, something off the shelf that's reputable, known to be good quality, you can actually save yourself a lot of forward and backwards and diagnostic works if there's an internal fault that uh, with the, the circuit boards. There's no wax on, wax off to wiring. It's it's all about trying to figure out what works for you as an individual. Nobody could cover all of the different engines, the different ECUs and the applications you could fit them to. What I'll do is try and cover some of the usual tripping points. But otherwise, as I said, it's kind of figuring out what works for you. What I tend to do with the MGBs when I wire those, I know all of the different Lucas wiring colors for the lights. So what I do is keep the original MGB wiring for the lighting harness, which I run down the right hand side of the car because it's closest to the steering wheel. Uh, I tend to fit a fuse box underneath the dashboard and then I'll run a main power from the battery to that fuse box. And then from there, to each of the individual switches and then onto the lighting. I try to maintain as much of the original MGB wiring colors as possible here. My advice would be to not cheap out and start putting short lengths of different coloured wire in there because it makes fault finding an absolute nightmare in the future. So if you need a you know, two foot piece of wire and it needs to be white and blue, just buy it because you're going to end up causing yourself lots of heartache if you have any issues down the line. And then for the ECU wiring, I tend to run that down the left hand side of the car. Uh, that also means that the wiring for that is away from any interference of the uh, any big battery cables or high power cables. You're not going to have any interference problems when it comes to sensors. And then wherever you mount your relays wants to be somewhere between the ECU and the fuse box with the idea that both can take and give supply to the relays easily. So I've mounted the relays onto this board that I've made. Uh, there's a big hole there which is for the cigarette lighter to go into. So whilst I'm wiring the relays, the, the fan input and output, I'm waiting on an orange wire for that. I tend to use the same wiring codes across all my cars uh, and I've run out of orange wires that I usually use for the fan. The fuel trigger 
and the fan trigger, I need to run a wire down from the ECU, which earths out the relays. So I'm going to just go ahead and cut those to the right size and terminate those. Uh, and then the other thing that I'll be doing, the input for the ignition switch I've already wired, but I'll also need uh, power to each one of these relays from the fuse box individually. So that if I do have any failures, they're all uh, on individual systems. I can mix and match things around without having uh, total failure across the entire car. There's plenty of different ECU types, but modern ECU to use the earth to trigger the circuits. Uh, so for instance, your injector, you would run uh, a power to your relay and then from your relay to the injector, and then the injector is earthed through the ECU. Yeah, I've I've not come across any that don't run this way. A lot of people seem to think that the power comes from the ECU, so that's something that trips people up. Before I go into any other sensors and that sort of thing, I'll briefly just cover why we use relays. It seems to be quite a common question that people don't really know what a relay does and what it's for. So for simplicity, let's imagine inside your switch, there's a piece of brass. It would usually be something that's high conductivity, but uh, the, the piece of brass is what I've got to hand here. So you can see I've polished this up nicely. If you take a fan, for instance, and you connect the negative to one side of the battery and then touch the brass on the other side of the battery, and then when you turn it over and look at the other side, what was once nicely clean polish, basically every time you touch that onto the battery, it, there's a small arc that goes from the, uh, the battery terminal to the brass. Now, if you imagine that this is something that you would turn on and off every time that you were in the car, for instance, a starter motor, which takes a lot more cranking amps than this fan does, how quickly that would destroy the internals of a switch. So you'd end up replacing the switch all the time. Inside a relay, you have a set of contacts, which they usually have some sort of hard wearing metal on the outside that's usually tungsten coated, something similar. And the contacts are actually triggered by a small switch to control a high loaded electrical circuit. Now relays come in many different sizes, but this is sort of a typical older format uh, automotive relay, which are easy to get off the shelf. Uh, on the bottom there, you can see there's five terminals. Now, generally, you'll if you're just controlling one circuit, you'll just use four of those terminals. So your main power lead, which you would be putting into the relay, goes to pin 30 and then the power out from the relay would go to pin 87. So that would go to your headlights, your horn, your fan, uh, starter motor, things that require high um, uh, electrical draw. And then to turn the relay on and off, you need to switch uh, number 86 and 85. So you can either ground 85 and then switch the internal side using pin number 86, or you can use for instance, an ECU to ground pin number 85 and just have the power input from the pin 86. The pin 87A, which you see in the center, 87A being alternate. So if you wanted something to turn on when the relay was off, the output from 87A would give you a live. So you can actually have your headlights, main beam and dip beam on one relay and it alternates between 87A, 87. Plenty of information on Google. Uh, if you look at images, you can get yourself a nice little diagram uh, to show you how to wire almost anything on there now. You can see the relay board that I've got here then. So I like to make these what I call mini looms where I can take uh, parts of the loom away to repair or change should I need to. It's not possible to keep everything separate without having too many connections. The looms will always sort of bleed into each other, but I do find that this just works for me. Rather than having to pull an entire loom out, if you want to change something, you can just pull that small section out and repair or change or uh, rewire it should you need to add something. It does all look daunting at first, but you've got to think there's 36 wires out of that ECU at max. It's a four-cylinder car, and some of those I'm not using anyway, so there's maybe 30 wires out of the ECU. Yeah, you've got the entire car wiring loom, but there's not really that many wires. If you just go through one at a time, it is quite logical. 
So I'm just going through the interior loom from the ECU at the moment. So that's all uh, anything that's going to stay inside. And then there's a separate loom there which goes into the engine bay. And it's just a case of narrowing it down and do one at a time. I wire all of the injectors and the coils onto one relay and then split the power from there to the coils and injectors and then I'll just run the single wires back. If you're running a VVT, you need to power the VVT solenoid and then ground the solenoid from the ECU as well. With regards to air and coolant temperatures, if it's a two wire version, the polarity in these is generally not sensitive. I tend to use Bosch sensors as the graph showing you the sensor voltage versus temperature is all readily available online. And the Emerald ECU actually comes with this set as a default, so it's one less thing to do. In the case of the MX-5 engine, I actually used the three pin coolant sensor from a stock MX-5. The reason for doing this was to negate a second coolant temperature sensor as I need to take a readout from the coolant sensor for a gauge as well. Unfortunately, the Emerald ECU doesn't have an output to power uh, a coolant gauge, so you need to run a wire to the sensor for this, and the three-wire MX-5 unit works well here. So one of the bits that's currently holding me up connector-wise on the loom is the TPS connector. So there's three wires for this. There's one signal, a uh, five volt positive and a ground, which I'll go back to the ECU. But I need to find out what order they go into. Now that's quite a simple thing to do with a multimeter. If you just set the, and to check for resistance. And then what you want to do to narrow down to the signal. So if you put these, uh, choose any two wires and then you rotate the throttle shaft. I seem to have got lucky that time first out, so you notice that the resistance didn't change. Which means that that's not one of the signal wires. So there you go, you can see that the, resist that the resistance is changing. I'll just double check and confirm. Yeah, okay, so we know that the top one here is definitely the signal wire, because when I had the two, connect uh, two probes over the lower two connectors there was no change when I opened the throttle position sensor so that gives us a signal which in this case is green so we'll throw that one into there that's figured out so the next way the next thing we need to do is determine the polarity uh, which is alive which it doesn't really matter too much the throttle position sensor uh, all the aftermarket ECUs you can reverse the polarity on the software but it is good practice just to have them in the correct place and if everybody else wires things up the same, it means that you can swap ECUs between cars, that sort of thing, if, you, if you're that way inclined. So we need to check for resistance increasing, which would indicate that it's a ground. So you can see here that the resistance is increasing. And on, if I swap the probes to the other two, you can see that it's decreasing. An increase in resistance indicates that the middle one is the ground. So go ahead and put the black wire into there. These uh, TPS connectors, some connectors like this, they have like a locking plate on there, so you just push that in. And then just double check everything. Connects fine. Perfect. And the job done. When it came to wiring of the crankshaft sensor, I found that the MX-5 sensor that I had was faulty. As my other cars all run a Jaguar Ford style crank sensor, it would make sense to maintain that commonality. It means that I only have to carry one spare for all of the cars. I made a small bracket which adapted the Jaguar sensor to sit in a similar location as the MX-5 sensor sat. Personally, I don't really like this single bolt design. It allows for rotation on the sensor, which means it can be knocked and uh, tapped out of alignment. The sensor gap is very sensitive to adjustment. You can be too close as well as too far away from the trigger wheel. So just find out what suits the sensor that you're working with. These Jaguar ones like to be around a millimeter away from the pickup points. This last section then is a bit of a prey and spray, a dump if you will, of information that I do think is useful and worth sharing. 
this is specific to the taller type Audi coil pack. So make sure that you're using the same coil pack as I am if you're going to be using this wiring. A little note there as well, just saying that if you're looking to boost your car, you're okay using a standard size ECU trigger, but you really want to up the size of the earths and the uh, power to these coil packs. When it comes to holding your battery cables down, I've found that a lot of the time it's just easier and neater to make your own sort of clips. So you can see these sort of like 90 degree little pieces of aluminium that I've cut up and bent just from two millimeter thick aluminium. And then I'm bending them around a eight millimeter socket here just to get a nice curve. So it'll follow the contour of the, uh, the cable. And you can see I've just put a little curve on the outside edge and these will get screwed down into the sill and they hold down the power cable and the rear loom as well. So if I do need to change anything, that's all quick, easy access stuff that I don't need to take a carpet out to get to. Going to be adding and removing looms quite a lot throughout this process. Rather than taping or using normal cable ties, get yourself a set of these quick release cable ties. They allow you to add and remove the loom as many times as you want without having to cut or get sticky residue everywhere. With regards to the NB VVT cam sensor, there's a specific part number for that and I didn't realize. So I just ordered a normal cam sensor for the back there. You can see how I've just put the little relief in the rocker cover and it actually allows the other type of cam sensor to fit. For me, this is a no brainer mod. Uh, you can literally just throw on any cam sensor from any of the MX-5s then. And lastly, but arguably the most important tip that I could give you is make sure that your earth for the ECU is clean and it goes directly to your battery. I've had this catch me out previously and it causes all sorts of weird running issues that are really difficult to diagnose. The guys at Emerald are really good for aftermarket support and they clocked onto this one right away so it was well worth a phone call. Thanks for watching, I hope you picked up some useful tips that might help you with your engine or ECU installation. If there's anything that you want me to cover in specific in one of the next videos or if you do have any other questions feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll help wherever I can.